Um, so we're going to talk today about pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy in severe male factor infertility. So we've reviewed PGTA before. As many of you know, I don't believe in PGTA for younger patients. The STAR trial, S-T-A-R trial, that we reviewed here on Fertility Factor Fiction and is available on our YouTube channel uh, from several months ago showed that there was no benefit to doing PGTA in younger women. What is PGTA? That's when you make your embryos, you grow them out to the blastocyst stage so they're now mature enough to use for doing a biopsy to determine if the embryo is normal or not. You do the biopsy, which involves lasering the embryo, allowing a little hole right next to where the placenta is forming. The placenta then extrudes through the embryo, or through the shell of the embryo, I should say. And then you're able to use a laser to kind of trim off a piece of that placental tissue and send it without any damage to the actual portion of the embryo that's going to turn into the baby, which obviously would be detrimental. We then analyze those cells. They use special techniques to amplify the amount of DNA, and then they analyze it and say, is this chromosomally normal or is this not chromosomally normal? And they can figure all of that out with the special testing that they have. Bottom line is that that whole process, when you're looking just at chromosomes, is called PGTA, and that stands for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. So it's a very useful test if you do need, for any particular reason, to rule out that the embryos are normal or abnormal. The problem is, initially, everybody thought this was again one of these holy grail situations in IVF and started doing it for everybody adds expense adds com complications adds complexity and time plus you have to freeze which is a good thing but nevertheless you have to freeze the embryos to do it and when that happened everybody said oh this is great we're finding out which embryos are normal or not we're tossing out all the bad ones problem is it actually doesn't improve your success rates so these guys decided to kind of hone it down and have a very sort of specific look at a different question and that question was what if the problem is that the male has obviously very poor uh, poor sperm well you know ostensibly you would think if the sperm is very compromised that may represent a problem where you're not getting the same results, you're not having the same outcome. And maybe guys with very weak sperm, they have more problems. They may not be as good as the guys with uh, normal sperm, so maybe they have a higher rate of aneuploidy or genetically abnormal embryos. So aneuploid just means not euploid, and euploid means genetically normal. So, you know, maybe these guys with severe male factor have higher rates. So the study is uh, quite interesting, um, and I, I wanted to review the data with you guys because it's always good to kind of, you know, recheck everything that we're doing, have a look, make sure that it's absolutely perfect, and that the research that we are presenting you with is correct for everybody. So maybe other people sat there and thought, well, my partner has really severe male factor. Maybe this doesn't apply to him. Maybe we should look at, at a different study. Okay, so this study did receive ethics approval from their ethics review board. Um, it's a single center study uh, actually done in Turkey. So not that Turkey's like the Mecca of uh, IVF, but it actually is a very well-developed country. Um, it has the world's ninth largest economy. They have lots of IVF centers, and there actually are a lot of good studies that come out of Turkey. So essentially what they did was they chose men with very severe male factor, less than one million sperm per milliliter, but they were genetically normal, their partner was normal, and the age groups were actually quite reasonable. So the ages were between 25 to 39 years for the women. 25 to 39 years is relatively young in the IVF world. We certainly have women that are much older doing IVF. And so this was a very reasonable thing to take a look at. They dealt only with single embryo transfers, which makes it easy. And they looked at the groups in terms of was there a euploid embryo or an aneuploid embryo to make sure that they knew what was going on. So um, with all of that in mind, uh, they analyzed initially uh, 795 couples between January of 2016 and March of 2019. And from those 795 couples, they eliminated all the women above 39 and less than 25, people that did fresh cycles because they were only comparing frozen to frozen, which makes sense. They got rid of the double embryo transfers, early transfers, day two, three, or four, 
um, men who just had absolutely no sperm, women with uterine anomalies, acquired uterine pathologies, chromosomal abnormalities, poor endometrial lining, so they're really narrowing down this field to exactly the people you want, medical conditions, which they left kind of blank, and then those who had missing data. So after they excluded everybody they needed to exclude, they ended up with 266 couples out of the 795. So a huge shrinkage and compaction of that data, okay, important. From that 266, you had 90 people that did do pre-implantation genetic analysis, and you had 176 people that did not. Okay, so between the two groups, there were differences, and this is really important. So I'm gonna pull up the study for those of you on Facebook and YouTube and so on. Um, just give me one second here for the rest of you. I will show it to you in a second. Um, okay, let's put that in the middle. Okay, so uh, if you go down to this portion here, and I'll try and blow that up for you so you guys can all see it. So um, you can see anywhere where the p-value is less than 0.01, you're actually dealing, or sorry, less than 0.05, you're actually dealing with something that is statistically significant. So looking at that data, and again, I apologize to the Instagram folks, sorry guys, there's no way to show you this at the same time as we're showing um, on the other platforms but essentially the female ages were different between the two groups. So PGTA average age was 34, non-PGT was age 30. So obviously the women in the PGTA group were a little bit older. Male age, same thing, 36 versus 34. Um, advanced female age, which they considered greater than 35, greater than or equal to 35, uh, I am not trying to disparage any women that are uh, over 35. This is just their definition. Um, it was 42.2% uh, versus just 14.2% in the uh, non-PGTA group. So there were some significant differences between these two groups. Why is that important? Because if you are comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to apples. But if you're comparing apples to something completely different, like a watermelon, you can't compare them. So you have to make sure that the groups are comparable or do the statistical analysis to control for those findings. And they did do that later on. Uh, there were a lot of smokers again. So uh, this is a sort of pseudo-European population in Turkey. 13.3% uh, in the PGTA group were smokers, 12.5% in the um, non-PGTA group. Uh, interestingly, uh, a fair number of patients had uh, previously tried infertility treatment in the PGTA group and a very high percentage had had multiple previous failures. So 77.8% of the patients that did PGT had actually failed before versus only 14.8% in the group that did not do PGT. So all of these are really, really critical. Also a higher difference in the number that had had recurrent um, pregnancy loss, which they defined as more than two losses. Okay, so um, where does all of this take us? Well, uh, if you look at the data again, um, the next table really was not very valuable, but this table is quite interesting. So this is comparison of ovarian stimulation and vitrified warmed blastocyst transfer characteristics and the luteal support regime. So essentially, there were no differences in any of the groups except the blastocyst, um, sorry, the number of vitrified top quality blastocysts was statistically different, but was numerically the same. So this is like fractions of a point, but they both had one for top quality blasts in both groups. The blastocyst rate was a little bit uh, higher in the uh, group that did not do PGTA. So maybe that's a suggestion that you're damaging the embryos, who knows? And the top quality blastocyst rate was definitely higher in the group that did not um, uh, do the testing on the embryos. Everything else was essentially the same. So maybe there's an impact on the embryos. It's a little bit hard to tell. Um, nobody knows for sure. Indications for the PGTA. So actually their number one indication was repeated previous failures. Advanced maternal age was the number two um, plus repeated failures. And then advanced maternal age alone, much lower. Uh, recurrent pregnancy loss much lower. Patient request was significant, about 12 uh, 
total patients, which was 13.3%. So um, th those were the reasons why they did it. Okay, so here's the most important part. What actually happens when you go through this? Well, you can look at every single outcome and none of them made a difference. Biochemical pregnancy, odds ratio was 1.15 in favor of uh, doing the PGTA, but not significant. Implantation was 1.06, not significant. Uh, clinical pregnancy, 1.19, not significant. Miscarriage was uh, less in the PGTA group. Again, not significant. Live birth, not significant. And multiple pregnancies were low because they were only doing single embryo transfers. And again, not significant. So even in these men who have very severe male factor and their wives are actually pretty healthy, youngish women with no significant problems, there is no benefit to doing the PGTA. Now, everybody should be saying, well, wait a minute, didn't you tell us a moment ago that there are problems with the data because the two groups were not equal. That is correct, the two groups were not equal. So what they did was they piled all of these numbers into an equation called an ANOVA or a multivariate logistic regression analysis. And they then sat down and said, okay, if we control for all of these factors, is the result the same? And the answer is, yeah, none of those confounding variables, advanced female age, male age, repeated previous failures, recurrent pregnancy loss, duration of infertility, or even the PGTA testing had any impact on the outcome. So they actually did screen for that. They did calculate for that. So bottom line is PGTA still is not useful even if it's severe male factor. Now granted, this is a relatively small study, only 90 patients with PGTA, but no one's done it this way before looking exclusively at severe male factor. So does it help to do PGTA in cases with severe male factor? No, it is a fiction that severe male factor will be benefited by doing PGTA. It is still unnecessary, especially in a young population of women less than 39 in this study, older than 25. And so it is not necessary in that group. Save your money it's not gonna help you guys, so do not do the PGTA. The study that came out with the STAR trial had lots of commentaries around it, and Richard Paulson, and I've talked about this before, who's a very well-known fertility specialist, said, listen, you're, if, when he did the calculations, he said, you're gonna lose up to 50%, 5-0% of your genetically normal embryos when doing PGTA because you'll discard them thinking they're abnormal or not use them, when in reality, they're perfectly fine to use and can yield a healthy, happy baby. So don't do PGTA unless you're older. Once you're over 38, 39, there is some value to doing it just because the statistics start to demonstrate that there's a very high rate of abnormal embryos and you don't financially want us putting in embryo after embryo that's abnormal until we get to a good one. But below those ages, don't bother. It's not gonna help you guys. So save your money. Do not fall into that trap. Even if the fertility center is telling you to do it, don't. One fertility center in Toronto, in particular, really forces people to do this. And uh, they're uh, telling even young women to go through with this for no good reason whatsoever. The science isn't there. It's a money grab. So don't do that, okay? Make sure you save yourselves the hassle and uh, you know, go ahead without it. It'll probably save you money and it'll probably end up with the same or maybe even better success rates. So avoid it, it's not necessary. So thank you again for watching that segment of the show. That was Fertility Fact or Fiction where we always cover a hot topic. This is a study that's just about to be published, not published yet. Um, it will be in Reproductive Biomedicine online if you wanna find it. The lead author was... Um, Mehmet Resit Osoglu, A-S-O-G-L-U. Um, so uh, that individual is uh, um, the main author on this study. And like I said, it's in uh, Reproductive Biomedicine Online, so you can find it. Again, the title is 
pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy and severe male factor infertility. So we're gonna take your questions like we always do. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment on our YouTube channel. That's www.youtube.com forward slash Dr. Victory, D-R-V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. Uh, we love the input, we need the feedback. Um, we've got loads of videos there and uh, we hope you get a chance to watch some of those. All of our fertility factor fictions are, are put there for you, usually within a few days of the time that we do the show.